This is Madam Speaker, and we're talking Budget Address 2019. Let me turn the attention over to my panel now, and Kai Sitole, maybe to start with you. The nation's major state-owned enterprises all seem, and I'm going to use the word bewitched, by administration problems that simply can't be solved uh, behind closed doors. Some would say it's got less to do with magic and, and more to do with pragmatism, where we keep failing. Yeah, I mean, the way I crafted that is that I simply said where Cyril Ramaphosa finds himself now is exactly where Macbeth found himself. He's been part of the architecture that's presided over the, the decline of the state over the past 20 to 25 years. And now he's in a position where he literally has to say, if we're going to save this country and actually have something to preserve for the future generations, the difficult decisions have to be taken. And when you listen to his State of the Nation address, you got the impression that he had finally come to that realization. And then you expected a follow-up from the finance minister yesterday, and then suddenly there was this tentative steps of saying that uh, ESCOM is going to get something over the medium term and the minister tricked us in that because remember this budget speech always talks about the medium term planning framework which is a three year pr process and then he said 23 billion rand a year. We all thought he's talking about 69 billion rand but no, he's actually committing to giving ESCOM 23 billion rand for the next 10 years. So these are the types of things that create this trust deficit between us and the politicians where you're simply saying look we are out here to try and listen and to assist you but be transparent, be honest and tell us exactly how big the crisis is and they're not doing that. Do, do you think, Angela, they're tricking us with the language because you have reorganization, uh, you know, you have restructuring or, and, and you have the unbundling, all of these big terms that we're using. But what he did say, and I want you to reflect on this, was I want to make it clear that the national government is not taking on ESCOM's debt. ESCOM took on the debt. It must ultimately repay it. And then, of course, you have thrown in for good measure the appointment of a chief reorganization officer. As an expert, you know, what does this all mean to you? Um, so I think in terms of clarity, it is that, is this a bailout? So if you're saying you're going to be giving 23 billion per year and that ESCOM needs to repay their debts, then what is this 23 billion? In fact, 150 in? billion over the next 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Right. so it is a question of clarity. What is this exactly? I think it's a good step in terms of defining that there is this management within SOEs, particularly with ESCOM, and I think there are steps in terms of unbundling, and that makes sense in terms of clarity. Unbundling, for instance, particularly with the generation of electricity in terms of capacity, that is good in terms of increasing the scope of competition, um, coupled with our IPPs, for example. So I do think there is a lack of clarity, not necessarily trickery with the language, but I think <laughs> there may be a lack of clarity in terms of explaining certain aspects to it. I thought it was all intentional. You, he was tricking us. Do you think he pulled a fast one, Kaya? Yes, it did. He must have. I mean, the reality here, a lot of people are still confused about what it is that's going to happen to ESCOM in the first place. They've got a 420 billion rent debt burden. If you split them into three, which of the three entities takes on that debt burden? And more importantly, what is the point of that, yeah. that split of the three entities? Nobody seems to know that at this stage. And this was an opportunity to actually give us a roadmap to say, this is how we've identified mm -hmm. three potentially profitable individual business units, and this is how we're going to turn them into profitability. We don't know that. When your yeah. eyes always where the rubber hits the road, and, yeah. and, and you know, for a lot of us thinking, okay, how does, okay, fine, uh, you know, the behemoth of ESCOM and the SOEs are fine, you know, we've got to find some green shoots, as they always mm. say, in our economy, but how does this all affect me? For people, millions of South Africans who are using public transport or commuting every single day, uh, how will this budget affect commuters and the transport industry? Well, we saw another uh, little fuel levy slipped in. Uh, it's called the carbon tax Was now. it also slight of hand? Yeah, it was, very okay. much so, because um, remember just 10 years ago, the fuel levy in the road accident fund combined was about 1 rand 50 per litre. Those two combined are over 5 rand, nearly 5 rand 50 per litre. So a new levy now, this carbon tax at 9 cents. 9 cents today, a rand in, in, in a few years' time. And, uh, and, and, and this, is, this adds up to billions of rands going back into government's coffers. Not ring-fenced, by the way, as if you know, they hide behind climate change uh, on, on introducing carbon tax levies. But if they were using it for uh, ring-fenced uh, to deal with carbon emission reduction projects or so forth, you could understand that. It, but it's not, just as the uh, fuel levy is not ring-fenced. And so, yeah, surreptitiously so slipped in and more cost. That's going to filter through to uh, so taxi to fares will go, yeah. will go up. Um, the Transportation, cost of everything. Cost of from one to markets, to the next, yeah, yeah, is, is going to balloon. Cost, yeah. Okay, you know, in, in, in the context of all of this, we, we talk about the ever ubiquitous ratings agencies and how to placate them. It, it feels like they spoil children that need, you know, something in their mouths all the time. Um, but let's come to uh, the ratings agency. I think their decision is out, uh, Moody's decision is going to be out in March uh, later this year. 
Do you think we've done enough, Clancy uh, Pai, to convince them that we are in a territory of stability? I just want to read. Um, I just want to read a little uh, uh, extract out of what they were saying. And I think that they, what they pointed out in their re response was the budget highlights the government's limited fiscal flexibility amid a challenging economic environment. Decipher that for us, please. Look, I mean, they're telling us <clears throat> that this guy's... I, I mean, I think if you go back to uh, Nenegate, that year when we had Nenegate and then we brought in Pravin Godan, he made some promises about where we would be right about now. And right about now, we said, you know, our deficit would be below 3%. We are actually now about... Four and a half percent, and which means we've missed every single target on growth, on borrowing, on debt. Which means actually they should be asking us the question: Where is this going, and when are you guys actually going to deliver on the promises that you've made? I mean, I think some of the key issues that they asked about was, for example, uh, reforming our institutions. Clearly, we are doing something about SARS. We're doing something about the NPA. Yeah. So there's yeah. something positive there. But I think on the key numbers that matter, we've been slipping and slipping. And so, if it, you know, if I look at them and I think, would they actually do anything differently? It would be because actually, you know, our 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 um, you know our prayers are clearly going straight up to heaven to be kept uh, at investment grade at the rate that we've been going. Well, here's the thing. I mean, you know, we, we have been lifting up the dirty duvet and exposing our, our, our linen, haven't we, Tanya? So, you know, so, some correct moves have been made to kind of expose some of the rot. Accountability is still a unicorn, I would say, in some ways. I'm waiting for mass arrests of people and for the jails to be full <laughs> of white-collar criminals. <laughs> Hello. But um, for, for, for right now, here is where we're at. And I'm struggling between all five of you to find out where, where your silver lining really was. So I think the stance that's been taken on corruption is clearly positive. The fact that there are more resources going into SARS and hopefully that's going to strengthen our revenue um, collection capability. The fact that the National Prosecuting Authority is going to be better resourced. Those are good signals. I, I like the stance that the Minister took in terms of that we need foreign skills, we must embrace them, we mustn't reject them. So those were, the, were issues I think that were, were well received. But, and I think what we've got to do is we've got to look at this budget speech in the context context of the State of the Nation address, which really was an honest reflection of our challenges. And I think the budget did the same thing. Um, the reality is there have been a lot of shifts during the course of last year which are putting us on a more positive course. Is it enough to keep our investment grade? I'm not sure, but we saw the job summit, we saw the investment conference, I think the economic stimulus package. The real issue is now we have to deliver. We can't keep on having lots and lots of mm. discussions about what we're going to do. We haven't bottomed out the visa issue yet. We need to actually do that properly. There's still constraints, even though we said we were going to do it, and that's one example. You know, in another context, you used um, the expression uh, was, was with regard to ESCOM pouring money into a sieve, e effectively. But when you look at the job situation, Kaya, Wayne, Angie, you can all weigh in on this one. Um, we are losing a tremendous amount of jobs. If you look at the mining sector and the proposed cuts there, you look at the retail sector and the proposed cuts there. Mm. Every time we try and you know, add in, in, in more jobs, we're losing jobs that go out the back door. Do you think that there was enough um, focus on how we arrest uh, job cuts in this economy, but also how we start to galvanize other areas in our, in our, in our economy, like the SMME sector, to really optimize in this context? Because, you know, that's... That's the prospect, right? That's where the possibility lies. I wouldn't say it was a question that there wasn't enough focus. For me, there was no focus at all. And when I say there is no focus, this government has never had a holistic focus about funding. of simply saying just how many people do you want to actually enter the workplace. If your answer is 500,000 rand, what exactly is it that you need to put in order to make sure that happens? And how do you monitor it? And how do you ensure that it is a sustainable project? So what you see is that the government is so fragmented with different policymakers who implement things haphazardly. You've got the small business ministry where a lot of people put their faith in it. But if you look at the budget that they have, I mean, quite seriously, that ministry may as well disappear into the DTI. But in any case, does the DTI know what the DPE is doing? Does the DPE actually understand what the impact of the electricity crisis is across every other system out there? It is that lack of holistic thinking that is simply the biggest problem with this particular government. Are we blighted by perforation? I think, across the system. You know, to Kaya's point, there needs to be better sort of coordination between governments and corporates. So, for example, I think... Tanya was saying earlier, or the question that you put in, were they bold enough in terms of their statements? And I think that there is scope for governments to say, outside of incentivizing them in terms of decreasing corporate in income tax, or now it's stagnant, 
Um, I think there is scope to say that corporates need to do A, B, and C in order to remain profitable. And I think you've seen this in other countries, for example, in the DRC, where they are quite unstable, but there's still so much investments going into mining, for example. So I do think corporates need to be playing a big role. I think they could have been a bit more boldness in terms of the state making that um, more of a statement, and I think there needs to be better coordination in terms of that. Wayne? Yeah, I think, I think look, you've got to understand that we are living with a Zuma era hangover, and you can't turn this economy around in one year. Uh, that's tough, and you also have an election, so he has to be very guarded, so he's trying to please as many people but as he possible. But he started out by saying this is not going to be a political speech. Well, but you know, you can read through it, because if the elections were behind us, I think they could have been more robust, and they want to be more robust. You can hear that. There was a statement that Tito said, do we need our state-owned institutions? Mm. Let's question that. Now, that is a big, strong signal because do we need SAA? Do we need Denel? We're not in the game of uh, competing. Government shouldn't be in the business of business, put it yes. that way. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying just hand everything over, but you've got to gently get out of these, keep the jobs as many as you can, uh, save those state-owned entities, make money out of them, and get rid of them because you are, we are just pouring money into them every year. Especially if you spend 10 years mismanaging them to such an extent that they've done. Exactly. Take a breath for me. We get closing remarks from all my guests. This is Madam Speaker.